baby, but you treat me so unkind. When I first met you, baby, you treated me like a king. When I first met you, pretty baby, you treated me just like a king. Yes, we've been together so long until my little love don't mean a thing. That's why I've got rambling. I've got traveling all on my mind. I've got rambling. I've got traveling all on my mind. Yes, I still love you, pretty baby, but you treat me so unkind. Well, you may not know it, but that made blues history in 1937 when it was written by the great blues man Robert Johnson. But this rendition is by Otis Spann, titled, I've Got Ramblin' on My Mind. This version was recorded in 1960. This is Lead Stories. I'm Eutrice Lead, and it is Free Your Mind Friday. No shortage, no shortage of things that you need to free your mind of, I'm sure. 888-874-4888 is the number to call and uh, free your mind. What do you think is, uh, what would you offer us, I should say, for consideration today? And uh, why do you think, why are you selecting that particular thing to talk about? It must be important and hopefully you'll give us a hint as to why you selected the topic you selected to talk about today. Uh, 888-874-4888. All right, we are ready to go. Harvey from Berkeley, you're on the air. Harvey from Berkeley, you're on the air. Okay. We're not hearing Harvey. Hi, ultra wonderful you trees. How are you today? Okay, what's up? Very good. Well, as you know, Pacific Gas Electric is now bankrupt because of so much death and destruction due to gas explosions and power lines that ignited at least 17 out-of-control wildfires, which killed a lot of people and animals and burned a thousand homes. And the aging and brittle and, and the aging and brittle nuclear power plant. Um, the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, the, the uh, plant's Unit 1 reactor is now shut down for refueling uh, between February 3rd and March 7th of this year. And it's the perfect time to inspect the reactor for embrittlement and cracks, as well as investigate the rest of the facility for the mishandling of radioactive waste, deferred maintenance, seismic vulnerability, and managerial incompetence before they refuel the reactor and there's a petition on moveon.org uh, that uh, people can sign to ask Governor Newsom to have the plant tested. And here's how you go to it. You go to Google and you type in moveon.org. That's one word, M-O-V-E-O-N, D, uh, uh, dot, um, O-R-G. And you put that into the search box and hit the button. And when moveon.org shows up, it's the first website. Just click on it. And uh, so when moveon.org website opens up, there's some words at the top of the site. And the first words uh, on the left-hand side says petitions. And uh, you drag your little arrow over the petition word and it turns blue. But don't click on it because another two words appear below the petition word. And the two words are browse petitions. And you click on browse petitions and the browse petition webpage opens up. And there's a search box near the top. And uh, you... you uh, it says a search for petitions and you use keywords. And the keyword, you just have to use one word, Diablo, D-I-A-B-L-O, 
which means devil, Dab- Diablo, into the search box and click the button. And uh, the petition, the second petition, uh, comes up, and, it's, and the title of it is Governor Newsom, Test Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant for Safety. And uh, you click on the headline, read the petition, and sign it if you agree. And if, the, if it sounded complicated, my instructions, you can always listen to uh, you, Teresa's program on PRN Archives to hear the instructions again. Because the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant <clears throat> is the most uh, destructive thing I can think of at this time. If we have a Fukushima-like meltdown there, as I mentioned previously, the, uh, because it sits on the coast and coastal winds always blow inland, the California Central Gra- uh, Growing Valley lies behind the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, and the radioactive clouds uh, would would, irri- would uh, irradiate all the f- the fruits and vegetables with uh, with the nuclear radiation, plus the water that flows from the Sierras through the Central Valley into cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco would become irradiated. And uh, you'd see a mass migration out of California. It would absolutely ruin the economy here. And uh, it could be the end of California. So moveon.org, that's that's where the, the petition is. And it's really important. It's not just important for people who live in California, but so much of the food that's grown in the Central Valley is eaten by Americans all you know all over the country. So that food, that food will become radioactive. So it's really a very important uh, um, issue here. And the power plant is is a if they built it over 50 years ago, it's really seen its day. And um, <clears throat> so now's the time. Governor Newsom has the ability to call for testing of the plant. So this petition would uh, tell ask him to test the plant and make sure that it's safe because better safe than really, really, really sorry. Thanks so much. Thanks for bringing us up to speed on that. Thank you. Thank you. 888-874-4888. Julie, you're on the air. Uh, Hello, uh, Idris, and hello to the audience today. Um, Thank you. I just... Just wanted to mention, um, after your discussion, uh, I'm usually at work and not able to call, but after the discussion about the uh, State of the Union message and one of your comments about um, not having any uh, people of color reporting the news, uh, I just wanted to mention that um, I watch the Real News Network, and surely I'm not the only one in this audience that watches them, but they're out of Baltimore, and they had a really uh, excellent discussion the other night. Um, They had a panel of three, uh, two African Americans and um, a a Latin, uh, a Latino, uh, Helena Alia, who uh, lectures on Latin America and um, Latin American issues. Uh, Eugene Pregier, who is a journalist and an author, and Jacqueline Lukman, who is the editor-in-chief of Lukman Nation. Um, her, her social media site uh, specializes in connecting history and politics involving social issues, which, as I, when I think about her, where her social media site, I think about your program. So uh, I just wanted to mention that to the audience that uh, and and since the show is archived think if you went back and looked at the real news network and uh, if, if you, you, you type in Trump's State of the Union and listen to that it's just a 30 minute discussion but it was quite um, it was a positive uh, discussion by African Americans which we don't see on the uh, corporate media so I just wanted to share that Well, thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, The point I was making is that on that night, when this major event was being broadcast, we saw evidence that the media, the general media, who take priority, who have special privileges in terms of access and so forth, so that they can report the news, it's, it's the same kind of dynamic we see. We don't see any black faces. We, we do not see an integrated newsroom at all. Of course, organizations like the Real News 
network and and others are filling in. But I am saying it's time to really get down on these media networks that continue to practice journalistic apartheid. We We should have no use for it. Here is a national event of some major significance because we have all these things going into preparation and everything. And you look and you see the state of affairs in America's newsrooms, totally, totally segregated. And we can't find anybody on a national on, on any national television program in the position of anchor or commentator or analyst, there, there are no white, there are no black faces, only white faces that we're seeing. So that gives us an, an indication that the media are following the, the customs of the Trump administration. There are no blacks visible in leadership positions. And in the media on that night, I mean, couldn't somebody say, to, <laughs> hey, let's, let's, let's mix this up a little bit and let us look like we have come into uh, the times. Let's look like we have uh, progressed. Let's not continue this stupid racist habit of excluding people who should be participating in explaining to the the nation and to the world what is going on. What is the problem there? That's, That's what I'm saying. But I'm glad that you were able to mention this because it at least promotes another uh, source that people can readily access. But again, even as you identify it, we see the limitations. They're not able because they, they, they're denied access. They're, they don't have the kinds of money to uh, invest in these elaborate um, preparations for coverage. And so it, it works against them. And in turn, it limits what the public can see. But I'm saying it's time to come down with a heavy hammer on all of these major media outlets who still in 2019, in your face, are telling you, we're in charge here. We're in charge. We're telling you what the news is. And you can't do a damn thing about it. Well, that's just my view. And I've been in this business for a long time. This has been the very reason for me getting into journalism to begin with. Because what we see and and read and, and hear in the way of information by now should reflect. I'm not saying that simply because you have a, a black person uh, broadcasting, it means that the news will be black. It's not like that at all. It is that by now, especially since so many studies have indicated that the nation's newsrooms are perhaps the most segregated newsrooms anywhere in the world. And yet people talk about, you know, diversity and all this it's, it's nonsense. The, the thing that we should begin doing is when you turn on the television and to watch the news and all you're seeing are these white faces and they're covering black topics, black areas, you know, I, I believe that any reporter, any competent reporter should be able to report on any kind of news, which is true. But what I'm referring to is the deliberate locking out of people of color in the discourse, the national discourse. You don't see them. You don't hear them. They're not there. Every now and then, you know, you'll see a black face or a Latina or or an Asian face, 
and it's it's almost uh, it's duplicitous. It's like the, the media organization saying, "Well, you know, let's let's really try and, and make an impression." But I'm sick of it. I'm just sick of it. So I don't watch television. I don't have a television. I really don't. This is years now, probably about eight years since I have had a television. I don't watch them. I don't need them. And I don't need to be irritated by this in-your-face reminder that this nation operates by a whole different set of rules. And they all lie about how committed they are to diversity and all that stuff. And you can sell that to somebody else. I'm over it. Gino from the Bronx, you're on the air. Well, 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 surprise, surprise, surprise. There's uh, an actor from years ago. Who was that, Goma Pyle? <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. Yes, I am, because I've been trying to get to you for the last four weeks. I've been sunshine. The cats outside the building were hungry. Uh, just holding on. I called early on. You're just too popular, lady. <laughs> Anyway, or maybe so, you're too slow on the draw. You need to be faster. <laughs> I'm gonna call what, what are you, you telling uh, us today? What are, you, what are you offering for consideration today? Oh, my mind has been bubbling for a month now. I've been trying to get through it yet. Where to begin? I mean, uh, last time was I got on the last three minutes. And uh, that was a, that had to be continued. So put a month on top of that. Well, how much time we got left? Oh, just, uh, what do we got, 30, 36 minutes, something like that? Okay, so anyway, first of all, Give thanks. We all woke up today, and we have a chance to further waken up with shows like this. Now, Utrees. Oh, oh, by a show of hands, how many people saw the movie I recommended uh, about five weeks ago, The Shack, with Octavia Spencer? No, I, I didn't. But anyway, make your point, because we have to move along. Hello? Hello. Yeah, Utrees. Yes, Hello. make your yeah, point. I, I, I was just interjected with the fellow telling me I should get to the point. Uh, okay, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, somebody back in the studio. So, okay, so the main thing, one of the major reasons I wanted to call was because there was a fellow, a new caller I recognized about five weeks ago named Donald, some other state other than New York. And he had mentioned that he goes up to people and say, how do you, how, how do you know you're a loving person? How do you know you love yourself? And he had had two, I believe, heart attacks or something. And I would recommend to him that he read Dr. Dean Ornish's book on reversing heart disease, the first medical doctor to show that over 25 years ago. People scheduled for a bypass did not need it. And I saw what they did to him. They put him in the back little pages of the newspaper, and he disappeared because he isn't dealing with uh, conspiracy theories as the last two years on CNN with Russiagate. This is something killing like more people each year than all our wars put together. Gary talked today about how 10 people needed new hearts. They didn't need it with his program. So I highly recommend that as a fellow listener out there. Check out Dr. Dean Ornish's work so you can stay around much longer and love yourself more and advise other people and how to do what the is, same. What is the name? You kind of ran over it Dr. Dr. Fast. Dean What's Ornish. Name? It's called Dr. Dean Ornish, who learned that from Swami Satchitananda, the guy who opened Woodstock, and he gives him credit for that. Uh, it's called How to Reverse Heart Disease. Dr. Dean okay. Ornish. O-O-R-N. I S H. So okay. That, that was, I, Thanks so, so much. To, Good to oh. hear from you today. Thank you. Leona from Michigan, you're on the air. Hi, greetings, you trees, and greetings to thank your you. audience. Thank um, you. Same to you. Thank you. Two things. Uh, uh, February 1st, 4th, rather, this past Monday was the uh, 106th uh, anniversary of the birth of Mrs. Rosa Parks. I just wanted to. Um, acknowledge that uh in case it in case others you know didn't know or or too busy but uh she um uh, contributed a lot to the uh i think to the um uh, fight for justice in in this country and beyond uh i had the privilege of meeting her once and um uh, i'll never forget it and uh um so she's her, her and in fact her mother's first name is the same as mine and uh uh, she invited me to sit next to her. Mrs. Parks did at a at a uh, at a gathering, and she shared some things with me. But, but fine lady, fine fine wise wise and gracious woman, Mrs. Rosa Parks. 
And and uh, there's a book out, The Rebellious Life. Uh, Jean Theo Harris wrote a book about the uh, the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, which is an, an interesting read. Yes, ma'am. That's one thing. The other thing I wanted to talk to about briefly or free my mind about is um, there's a man named uh, Charles Lewis who has been in prison for 43 years and counting. Uh, he was uh, locked up at the tender age of 17. And um, many things have happened over the course of that 43 years. He's always maintained his innocence. He was charged with murdering a uh, police officer, an off-duty police officer, who was white. Charles Lewis is a black guy. And um, there's, a, there's a source, there's, there's a, a um, blog or newsletter called Voice of Detroit. Dot net, where those who are interested can can read about this man's case. Uh, I got uh, kind of like involved in the last year or so because I met his mom, and um, and her name is Mrs. Rosie Lewis, and uh, she's she's been fighting for forty three years to try to get her son free. There's been mishap after mishap with his court case. Um, they're, they're, he's a musician, and they're they're they're. Uh, forgive me, I'm trying to stay focused here. The partner of the slain officer said that somebody else was responsible for his partner's death. But, oh, I've never seen anything like this, the way this court system works. Um, But I I would refer people to um, voiceofdetroit.net for... um, information about Charles Lewis's case. He's going he's to have another hearing on February 14th in Detroit uh, at the uh, Frank Murphy Hall of Justice Room uh, 502, Judge Quinn Lillard. Uh, I was there at the last uh, uh, hearing, and, uh, you know, they talked to him via video conferencing, and he could not, they couldn't have the video conferencing because nobody knew the code for the video um access. Really bizarre. They, they've lost his case files. Uh, it's just a travesty of justice. And, and in closing, I just want to, I just want to uh, say one thing, uh, and I'll be quick. And this is a quote from Charles, because uh, um, he was, uh, he, this was uh, in 2018. He, he, he was talking to the prosecutor and the, uh, his defense attorney, and, and he was saying, it's a, and he was talking about the lost files. Uh, he was saying that um, it's imperative that you have that. Right now to this day, you cannot get the names of the 12 jurors that you say found me guilty. If you can go get them right now, I'll buy out, bow out right now, and you can give me life without parole, and I'll go back to my cell and sit on my bunk for the rest of my life. Because it's not there. You know what I'm saying. The system failed when I had an appearance at evidentiary hearing, which is based on missing witnesses. Witnesses were missing at the trial. I filed an appeal, going on appeal. When we get down there, the witnesses came in and testified. Technically, from their testimony, I should have been granted a new trial. The system failed. Guess what happened? The transcript came up missing. It took me 10 years to get a copy of the transcript. The the system failed. It's a system that's going to continue to fail. This is the reason why you've got guys like Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. This is the reason why you have NBA players stepping up and saying, hold up, wait a minute, the system has gone too far. It's not working. We've got to do something about this. This is the epitome of that. This is a blatant example of what people are protesting and marching about in the streets. No, a lack of justice. This is it well, right Well, here's, here. here's the problem. Here's yes, the ma'am. The problem is we've, we've been here many, many, many times before. Yes, ma'am. And once again, it shows that there is no organization. There is no one really that can be counted on to act as, you know, a watchdog especially in areas where African-Americans are extremely vulnerable. This is one of them. How many cases does it take before we get an idea that the criminal justice system is 
is just a labyrinth of injustice. Mm-hmm. How long does it take? Who in our community is specifically taking on the role of advocacy and getting the community moving and getting legislators moving? A lot of what needs to be done, no matter how uh, uh, vigilant people are, it is within a system that is organized and galvanized against the community. There's only mm-hmm. there's a limit to what people can do and how effective effective they can be. Mm-hmm. We just refuse to get it. We keep mm-hmm. going down these roads all the time, and they lead to nowhere. The community at some point is going to have to draw a line and it's going to have to step up into a role. It's going to have to do it. Mm-hmm. We will hear about this ad infinitum and it's happening because there is no fear of the community and whether it would have the appropriate influence to get things done, get things changed. Elected officials are not afraid. Mm -hmm. And we keep frustrating ourselves all the time because people now are are looking to their, their neighbors and friends to help, but their neighbors and friends can't help. Mm-hmm. But so much. I mean, they can talk about it and they can hold rallies. That is not what is going to produce results. Okay. So this is beyond a national emergency. We have literally hundreds, if not thousands, of prisoners who are languishing for all kinds of spurious reasons in prison. And they can't, there's nothing being done. Yes, ma'am. We have to get, we either make up our minds or to, to do something, or we just have to just let it go. Don't try to tell people about how awful things are. Mm-hmm. They are awful. We know that. The mm-hmm. question is, what are we doing about it? Right. That's the question. Yes, ma'am. That's the question. And until we answer that question with some clear evidence that we mean business, we are serious about this, it will continue. And with no kind of fallout for a system that is doing it and the officers doing these things, they suffer no problems at all. But we have to get serious. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Leona. Great to hear from you. Maat from New York, you're on the air. Yes. Uh, Greetings to the beloved family and to our our talk show host, (laughs) Utrees. Yeah, I I want to. uh, After sometimes you just have to relate to what a particular caller has said, and I want to make some comment on um, what Leona brought up. Um, I just recently, and I thought I was someone who really knew how draconian and diabolical uh, how they came up with and and operate the uh, prison system, but I recently heard um, uh, one of the uh, rappers, Meek Mill, and some other people have come together. I think it's called uh, um, Justice Alliance or Reform, uh, Justice, something like, like that. They've come together because the parole and probation system is also so uh, draconian. You know, it could be just missing, being 10 minutes late for, for you know, your parole appointment, uh, that ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's something that has just become almost solidified, and, and somehow uh, everybody just went along. I remember uh, some years ago where uh, this um, um, mass shooter, it, I think it was in, in Norway, it was either, I think it was Norway, 
and he w- there was some sort of a retreat with people who yes. were uh, left leaning and and you know saying protect the immigrant type of thing, and he came out from that far crazy far right, and he shot I think it was two or three dozen people, and what I found so interesting was that. He got a, a peek into their prisons, and he basically got, in terms of his prison sentence, uh, a very well-appointed studio apartment, right, was the, the their prison cell. And I think that's also the, the country that whatever you did, you get a maximum of 21 years. So, you know, uh, well, well, let me connect it also, and I haven't had a chance to research it. I don't know if anyone followed up, but that's why it's so important. I mentioned, per chance, uh, with John Berman in, in, you know, like between 8.30 and 9 a.m., of Marianne Wil- Wil- Williamson. She is the only one, and, and you do have the primaries and all the debate and discussion. She is the only one that's talking about our situation in this country in a way that it is a good time now for that to be captured and for that discussion uh, to go on. And lastly, I want to... Ma- the, the, thing, the thing is this. People keep running away from the central question. And the central question is, you are aware of a critical issue having inordinate impact in our community. And you're still looking for somebody else to solve the problem. We do not have a consistent effort of affected communities mobilizing in their own interest. Nobody is doing that kind of work. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but few, very, very few, and they are taxed beyond their limits. We do not act like this is a problem. We do not act like this is an urgent problem. And we walk away. We give the system permission to do whatever it wants to do. We are unorganized, and it looks like we have, as a community, no intention, no interest in organizing about the the uh, major issues that we are confronted with every single day. We don't prioritize these things. We expect somehow the same system that is doing all of this wrong to suddenly experience an epiphany and would begin to do the right thing. It doesn't happen that way. It wasn't designed to operate that way. So it is irritating to me when, and I'm not saying you or anybody else in particular, we know what the problem is. We have to confront our own communities. What will it take to get your attention and your involvement in solving these things that are impacting your community in a a totally disproportionate way? What will it take to wake you up? Would it take a whole generation of people being wiped out via the prison system? What will it take for people to take on some measure of the responsibility to create these changes themselves? Because this is what is needed, citizen action. We have opted out, we have copped out, we have given ourselves all kinds of reasons as to why we can't get involved, as to why we can't solve the problem. And then we point the accusing finger at the same system that is doing us in. We can't have it both ways. So there has to be some kind of a resolution here. Either you're prepared to fight, 
you're prepared to roll up your sleeves and get into the fight to reorder this crazy way in which we live? Or we just shut up and go away? That's, that's the issue. It's not about what the government is doing. They've been doing this since, what, 400 years ago. What will it take to get people to understand how serious the problem is and that in whatever way they can, they should begin to organize as best as they can and, and put together something that represents a reasonable alternative, but to work on it, to make an investment in your own community. We don't see any evidence, really, on a consistent basis that black people are serious enough about their oppression to get active in opposing it. That is a source of constant frustration to me. Thank you so much for your call. Uh, Patricia from New York, you're on the air. Good afternoon, you, Teresa, and good afternoon to the PRN family. I hope all is well. Thank you so much. Same to you. I have only two brief comments. Um, just to piggyback on your last comment, and you know that I am in total agreement with your statement, because we have one of two choices. We either can allow people to do things to us or we can resist. And as you know, I am one of these Sunday morning talk show participants in an effort and an attempt to just bring a little bit of um, a different viewpoint to the listening audience. And so what do you think has happened to me? My number has been blocked so I can no longer get through. So the point I'm making is before you can get people to respond, they really need to have an understanding of the condition in which they live and the fact that they are not powerless and the fact that they can respond and do something about it. Unfortunately, our people are just not there yet. They continue to listen to everyone who says to them, just come out every two years and vote and every four years and vote. And that seems to be their sole response because that is the diet that they are being fed. So I absolutely agree with you that unless we are prepared to, re to, to respond, then we just need to sit down and shut up and just roll over and just, you know, let, allow what happens to us happen. Because if you're not resisting, then you're just accepting, and I was never in that mode. The second thing I'd like to um, just uh, announce is actually an announcement. If anybody lives in the New York, New Jersey area, a week from today, next week Friday, at the Thomas Jefferson Middle School in Teaneck, New Jersey, they will be honoring Leola Weaver Maddox, the wife of um, our beloved Alton Maddox. They will be dedicating their media, um, media cen center at the middle school in, in her name. So anyone who lives in New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, uh, New York area, please, um, if you can, attend that dedication. I think it would mean a lot to Leola and a lot to Alton. Well, of course, uh Leola, as we need to say, has, has passed. Yes, yes. But talk about a soldier. Yes. Talk about, talk about a soldier. Yes. And steadfast and resolute and committed. And I wouldn't even feel ashamed to say that that is precisely one of the contributing factors, I think, to her death. She worked so hard. She gave so much of herself. And she put herself second and third and fourth. And the community always first. And, and this is one of the things we also have to consider. When people don't step up to the plate and they leave it to people like Leola Maddox to do the work, they need to understand that they are imperiling even the health of such people, like Alton yes. as well. Yes. You cannot do this kind of work and not 
see the toll it takes on your your body, your system. You, you're you're a finite human being. You cannot take on infinite responsibilities. Everybody has to do something. So I'm glad you 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 raised that name. I'm glad that uh, there's going to be some recognition, some thanks, because that's the other thing. They do these things, this work, so consistently at great sacrifice. And we don't even bother to thank people who do this. So it would be good if people could show up and, and, again, and demonstrate yes. that they, they remember. So could you again, just repeat again the venue? Yes, I'm going to do that. It's the Thomas Jefferson Middle School. It's located at 655 Teaneck Road in Teaneck, New Jersey. And the dedication begins at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay. Thanks a lot, Patricia, for your call today. Okay. Let's hear from Linda from Brooklyn. Patrice, how are you? Okay. Can you? How are you? Oh, that's great. I am fine. Uh, I like the last three callers that called in. That was really right on point. But what prompted me to call in is when you talked about the media and the press. And uh, I do Wikipedia articles, and I've been doing one on the Associated Negro Press. I didn't even know it had existed until about two years ago. If I did, it probably just went past me. But that was when we had a powerful media. And I have learned so much from working on this about Claude Barnett. And when we had, when our media actually had power and tracing how it was destroyed. And today we're back to where we were in 1968. And, and one of the main factors that destroyed the Associated Negro Press, it was integration. When mainstream media started to give our issues a little attention. So then, so then we gave up what we had to be included in something else. And now look, look what we have today. Well, what the major media did in that in that period was really sinister. They it was very sinister. Sought, yes, they sought to destroy the black press, and they exactly. raided the black press of its talent. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly that's how you saw the integration of America's newsrooms. Because all the people who should have had access to jobs wherever they wanted to have them couldn't. They were, this was American apartheid, plain and simple. Information mm -hmm. uh, was a, a race-based commodity. And people wh who were in the business, if you were mm -hmm. black, the, it was understood. The only place you could work is in a black newspaper or black media yeah. outfit. You weren't paid the, the best salaries. You didn't get the best benefits. You didn't get the advantage even of exposure and career advancement. So it, it was a sad thing all the way around. But, 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 but supposedly but after I, the uh, newsrooms were integrated, we shouldn't be exactly. seeing what we saw the other Today. night. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And one of the things I found most fascinating in my reading and research and writing about the Associated Negro Press is how powerful the press was when it was just as powerful as the church. I mean, that was like, wow. And then also what I gained from it, too, is the fact that we had so many people reading. We had like four million people reading. And nowadays people make this statement, we don't read. And then I will say, but we did read. There wouldn't have been. Well, a, a, you know, a, what so you're pointing we to. We wouldn't have had that is, empire if we didn't read. So the fact is, we did read. We had to. And it to. was very powerful. We and had it to read. Huh? We had to huh? listen to black radio stations. We had to patronize black media outlets because white media simply was not covering anything having to do with our community. Exactly, nothing, a zero, a blank. Crime, but... Yeah, crime, murder, and mayhem. But exactly, it's an unintended benefit in the end because mm -hmm. the black press was in its heyday. Uh, they raided the black newsrooms. 
and got mm-hmm. its best talent. Because exactly. the white reporters, they didn't want to send them in harm's way to report yeah. on the burgeoning civil rights movement. So they snatched them up from the black uh, news uh, uh, organizations that they worked for and began the process of destroying the black press. And then by then we had people, you know, just gravitating toward white media. They were so grateful to see a black exactly. face on the front. <laughs> they said, so we oh, lost oh, hours. We lost it. Yeah. And, yes. and what I'm amazed about the Associated Negro Press, the black press, period, and there's another book called Race News, along with Gerald Horn's The Rise and Fall of the Negro Press. But, but what I'm impressed about is they had power, and they knew they had power, and they used their power. And they were very international, and they were, they were Pan-Africanists. Sure. And how they took our struggle abroad and covering wherever our people were experiencing uh, racism. Well, the it, first formal and organization. The women, and, and, and there were so many amazing women involved in this, too. And writers and and a lot of them volunteered their services and they saw it they saw it as a duty and as a responsibility. Our community has a very, uh, I think, a proud tradition of people stepping up to the plate to respond in the areas where they were qualified and experienced and knew how to make a difference. You know, the, the first black newspaper was not founded by a newspaper man. <laughs> <You know. laughs> uh, we, we didn't Indian have... Press started in 1919. You talk about people who came out of the church. They, came, they were professionals in other areas. Some were physicians. Some were, you know, in other fields entirely, but understood the importance of information. Exactly. You know, and being uh, involved. Yeah. have a very exactly. strong tradition of that. So, did you, did this apartheid coverage hit you at all when the State of the Union was covered? I looked at about two minutes of the State of the Union. That was about it. The only reason why I looked at it, people were talking about it on Facebook. So I tuned in after about two minutes. After watching him swinging his hands around, I had to cut it off. I couldn't look anymore. I tell you. <laughs> and I don't even have a television set. I went to YouTube to look at it. And I don't think I've had a TV set for 15 years. Woo. <laughs> and, 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 and this is where we want to go. You're not getting information. You're getting distortion. You're getting uh, incorrect information. So it is not useful to you in the way it's being served up. It is not useful to you if you have as a priority in your life making a strong contribution to your community. You're not getting the information there that you need. So You have to go and get the information you, you need. You have to probe. You have to find it. We can't just turn on a channel. No, you can't. It doesn't, and, it, it, it no, doesn't work. Silliness, and, silliness and is were, news. And you were talking about community. I ran across this amazing book by accident, just probing, called Awakening Communities. And it was written in 1932. Hmm. And how they organized communities in the state of Louisiana. And now I'm trying to find out which communities were African-American communities. And then they had the folk schools, and and they saw it as, and it was interesting how the writer sees it as it's your responsibility as a community. You know, you have to, you or communities have to be organized. You can't just, like what you just said, it's the same thing I'm finding in this book, you can't expect government and your local officials to do anything for you if you're not organized as communities. Right, it's a form of, of, of protection, you know. And right. you, you recall things like Ida B. Wells starting a newspaper in the basement, 
with exactly. just single sheets of paper, 25 cents worth of paper. I mean, and then, and then like, what, like you were saying, every problem should have a project connected to it, not just something you talk about. Where's your project and, uh, associated with the problem? If there's no project associated with the problem, then we're just talking. I tell you, we have a long way to go. <laughs> and our, we keep thinking that the answer is out there. The answer was back there a long time ago. A hundred years ago. We had answers. I'm looking at 1919. The Associated Negro Press was in 1919. Chicago South Side built a strong black community, and they called it the black metropolis. Their dream was not integration. I mean, even the, even the dream was hijacked. The dream was to build a black metropolis. And what they did from 1919 to 1929 is absolutely amazing. Well, they did more in we, 10 years, and we could sit and talk for 50 years. We cannot say whole- that we, we don't have prototypes. We don't have examples. We don't we do. have the, the, exactly. the means. We can't make that excuse. So at some point, we just have to face ourselves. Are we going exactly. to be responsible for our communities or not? It's such a joy talking to you today. I thank you for calling. Thanks, Linda, for calling in and sharing your thoughts. And that brings us to the end of our program today. The weekend, of course, is upon us. It's a good time to just ratchet down a little bit and, and surround yourselves with people who put positive things in your life. And we'll see each other Monday. Bye-bye. Ah.